So 2018 is the year of engineering. So I'm just going to do a bit of engineering for you. Okay, so you can buy this thing called the Sonic Boom. Uh, costs about eight pounds. And it's a gimmick. It's an acoustical gimmick. It's an external loudspeaker, a little boom box, if you like, which you can use to play stuff from your phone or computer. Uh, but it has a little feature. You can detach the little driver or actuator from the speaker. And that means you can do some interesting thing. So, um, this is what the driver alone sounds like. <coughs> You can just about hear it, okay? If you can't, then you need your hearing tested. Um, then, we, I'm going to put it on this plate. So, it's on the garden plate. Let's see what it sounds like on the plate. Bit better. You agree? Okay. And now I'm going to put it on this enclosure. What do you think? It's a pretty good loudspeaker now, okay? So, what I'm hoping is that you and children would be interested in knowing why that is the case. So, in order to understand why that's the case, they need to know a little bit of acoustics. And I'm sad to say, that acoustics doesn't feature much in any of the school curricula, college curricula, or university curricula. And so my mission today is to try and persuade you that it is worth having some acoustics. So because it's the year of engineering, the Engineering UK and the Royal Academy of Engineering are presenting lots of different programs to encourage children and teachers to take an interest in engineering. And one of the programs is Tomorrow's Engineers. And if you were to follow the link at the bottom, that's one of the few instances where something that's acoustics related appears in this program. And actually, the link sends you to um, a guy from Max Fordham who tells you about room acoustics, tells you about his work in room acoustics, which is, which is fine. But room acoustics isn't the only kind of acoustics that you can have. Acoustics has always suffered from being a Cinderella subject. And in the 19, early 1950s, I think it was, someone called Robert Bruce Lindsay who noticed this because it's been a Cinderella subject for a very large number of years, um, developed something called, he called the wheel of acoustics, which is basically to show how something related to acoustics occurs in lots of different uh, fields. So if you're interested in music, then obviously it's obvious that acoustics plays a part. Uh, if you're interested in architecture, then again, it's obvious room acoustics are important. Um, and theatre acoustics and concert hall acoustics. Um, <clears throat> but of course, acoustics also features in various kinds of engineering. And I've worked in engineering departments most of my life, so most of the research that I've initiated, either at the Open University or briefly at the University of Hull while I was there, have related to engineering applications of acoustics. So I can tell you about some of them. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be saying more about the pulse reflectometry for checking instruments later. Um, one of the current hot topics is crowdsourcing for research. Um, there is a, uh, a thesis that it's important to try and <clears throat> break down the barriers between university level research and what the public perceive. And of course, you're having to do that also if you receive any grants from the research councils, because you now have to talk about impact. And one way of uh, breaking down the barriers between 
the ivory tower research and what the public perceive, perceive is to get them to do the work. Um, and the Open University in 1970 pioneered doing that. We had a, a foundation course in technology which had 4,000 students distributed throughout the UK, including Northern Ireland. And we got them, we, we issued them with small sound level meters. So they were able to do measurements of the sound levels around them. Uh, and we also gave them assignments to do systematic kinds of measurements. And we also used the data that they produced uh, in order to help uh, the building research establishment, as it was, was then, in the, investigate certain things to do with the standards that they generated. Um, those of you who work on the noise side of environmental health will know about BS4142. Well, the, I think the 1987 version of it, or in the earlier one, um, talked about the fact that the sound level you get in an area depends on the type of area. Um, and it had various notional levels for what you should find in a rural area or an urban area. And they were able to use our students' data to check on what those levels were and identify the extent to which that you could get a reasonable prediction using the, the then British standard. These days you have to actually measure the background noise level in any investigation, but um, that's another story. So that's the noise surveys. Uh, I've also been interested a lot in outdoor sound. In fact, I've published a book about outdoor sound prediction. Um, and last year, I, at this equivalent seminar, I was talking about greening for noise control, how by deliberately introducing green areas in towns and alongside surface transport corridors, you could improve the noise climate. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about a particular application there, uh, but I can only do a skim of any of these things, because my main mission today is to, to convince you that acoustics needs to appear in lots of curricula. Um, so while I was at Hull, I also was interested in laser-generated um, high-intensity acoustic pulses. Basically, if you focus a laser beam, you can cause the air to break down, and that causes a spark, like you would get between two electrodes, and the spark generates a very intense, broad uh, range of frequencies. So you can use that for doing kind of model investigations, if you like, of sound propagation. Another colleague at the Open University has been involved in generating sound from plasmas, which is a related thing, um, and using that in, in a so-called plasma loudspeaker. <coughs> we go round the other part of Lindsay's wheel with some of the other things we've done. We've been involved in trying to determine how rough a water surface is using sound. Um, we've been interested in the physics of different kinds of surface waves. These are waves that cling to a surface and decay away from the surface. <coughs> we've been interested in a phenomenon called acoustic to seismic coupling. So basically, if you play a sound uh, above a surface, then to a very small extent, you make that surface vibrate. Uh, and if it's a soil, then you can determine the condition of the soil. You can also determine whether or not there's something buried in the soil. And of course, that's of interest for uh, a non-invasive way of detecting landmines. So we got involved in some of that work. Um, we've also been involved with actually using our ability to predict outdoor sound to detect and classify different sources for uh, out of military interest. Um, we've also been involved in early detection of osteoporosis using the fact that the sound, sound travels in an, an osteoporotic bone in a different way from in a healthy bone. <clears throat> so all of these are applications of acoustics we've been involved in. There are a few hundred researchers in acoustics within the UK. So you can imagine the number of different applications that there are. We haven't done very much in speech or psychology, uh, but then some of what we're going to be hearing later today may relate to that area. So it's easy to actually complete Lindsay's wheel. 
One of the things I talked about was roughness-based noise control. There was an article in a recent acoustics bulletin, that's a sort of journal of the Institute of Acoustics in the UK, saying that the future of noise barriers is basically build them higher. Um, and so I've been interested in the possibility that if there is enough space around a surface transport, around a road or a railway, then you can do other things. You can modify the ground. Instead of having uh, a six metre wide pa pavement, for example, you could have three metres with this sort of brick structure on it. There's, I won't go into the physics of why that does anything, but if you use a loudspeaker, you can see that for this kind of geometry, if you've got a 0.36 metre high receiver and you're 10 metres away and your source is only 10 centimetres high, then you get an insertion loss of nearly 10 dB, which is a halving of loudness. Um, and we did drive-by tests with the same configuration, and we could get, even with this just fairly, th only 2.3 metres wide brick lattice, two bricks high, um, we could get nearly 3 dB reduction. And 3 dB is not to be sneezed at because it actually means a halving of the sound energy. So that's the, the, the rough surface. So one of the, my other things is how acoustics, of course, is important in studies of music and of musical instruments. And I have a colleague at the university, David Sharp, to whom you should address any particular questions about this work, um, who's developed a way of condition monitoring of a wind instrument by sending a pulse of sound down it and looking at the reflection. Um, and by doing this, he, he's able to work out if there's any um, infidelity in the bore of the instrument, or indeed if there's something as bad as a crack, or indeed if there's a leaking pad. All of this is uh, evidence from the display of his results. Um, he's also developed a way of artificially blowing a wind instrument and also looking, using the pulse re reflectometry to tell him about the vibrations of the wall. So the material of which the instrument is made makes a difference the way the instrument performs and he's able to investigate that. And he uses, um, the, and I suppose this is where some of the acoustics gets into the psychology side of things. He also gets different professional players and amateur players to play different instruments that he's already investigated to see what they think of the quality. So he's able to match the subjective impression with the physical measurements. So I've talked about research, which is kind of postgraduate level. Um, but acoustics is important at all stages of education. Now, there's a current government, UK government initiative based in, partly in the same, for the same reasons as the fact that 2018 is the year of engineering and Engineering UK and Royal Academy of Engineering have lots of things trying to get young people more interested in engineering. Um, one of the things the government's trying to do is develop a... Um, what used to be done by the former polytechnics, a more technical, vocational kind of education at uh, university level. And one of the things that's generating that interest is the fact that we have a shortage of technicians. We have a shortage of people who want to be technicians. And one of the things we're doing within the uh, Institute of Acoustics is supporting an, an initiative to try and get a, an acoustics engineering technician scheme accepted by the government. We already have the description of that technician called a standard. We have that accepted. So the next stages are to try and find a provider and to agree and get a syllabus agreed. Um, but this is the kind of the, the, the lower right hand of the slide shows you all the different kinds of jobs we're trying to cater for. One of the problems with acoustics, part of the the, the cause of it being a Cinderella subject, is that because it applies in lots of different instances, it tends to apply to relatively small companies, relatively small concerns, consulting firms and so on. Um, and so these are the kind of jobs that get done or are needed. Uh, we need people trained who can do these kinds of jobs in these smaller, small to medium enterprises, you might call them. 
The only way educational activities range across the, the, the different stages of education. So, um, as well as our postgraduate diploma in noise control, which people can take as a way of qualifying them uh, to become a noise consultant, it's, or in fact, it's strictly, it's to become a member of the Institute of Acoustics, but most noise consultancies now ask people to be members, and if they don't have an alternative qualification, they need to take the diploma. But also these certificates, these short courses, cover the kind of things that the acoustics engineering technician might be going to do. So we have one to do with environmental noise measurement, workplace noise risk assessment, management of occupational exposure to hand arm vibration, building acoustics measurements, and specifically for the Antisocial Behaviour Act in Scotland, we have a course which covers what is required for someone doing measurements to, in, in accordance with that legislation also. So now we get into schools, and here I think acoustics also has an important role to play. And one of the things we've developed, or at least a colleague of mine, Richard Coleman, has developed, um, is this school's activity. Basically designed a little soundproofing box with detachable panels, and several different materials are available for each of these panels. And so he'll go into a class, say 30 students, and he'll divide them into six groups of five, and he'll say, you're now going to be involved in a competition to use these materials to get effectively an effective soundproof box. Um, this is a model of your room in which you're going to be a member of a band and you're going to practice and you've got to try and make sure you don't disturb anybody else in the house. So the better you can soundproof the, 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 the room in which you're doing the practice, the better. You're given a miniature rock band, which is basically a... A, a, a little um, MP3 player along the lines of that sonic boom and um, an off-axis off fan to act as a, a model drum set. Uh, and you do various measurements and the kids themselves generate the ideas about what they're going to do. Of course, they, one of the first things they think, since one of the materials they're given is cotton wool, is if they stuff the box full of cotton wool, that will do the job. Um, of course, you need to point out that means the band couldn't breathe. Um, and so they go back to uh, thinking about other things. And they also have to work to a budget. So this is an exercise not just in understanding a little bit about sound, but also in doing the kind of um, design to a budget that they may end up doing if they ever become engineers. So here is another important thing, in my opinion. It amazes me that people who are taught about music aren't taught anything about acoustics, except in a couple of instances. Mm -hmm. Only three out of 71 institutions we've looked at um, do any acoustics teaching, which is daft, really. And I see, see that quote from a flautist at the Birmingham Conservatoire. If your professional life is going to be involved in producing sound, surely you need to know something about sound. And yet, that doesn't happen. Why? I don't know. I think it's part of um, uh, educational snobbery, but I won't go on about that. Um, I just try and advocate that there should be something. Um, in fact, a, a, another colleague, Luis Gomez Agostina at London South Bank University, has pursued this topic in some depth and talked to people about what they would need. And they all agree that something is needed, and they also agree what uh, sh sorts of things should be in it, should be in a course. So that course is, what, what should be in that course is, is, is known, and it just needs promulgating amongst the people who, who are the music educators. And maybe Lewis will achieve that through running workshops amongst the institutions who've shown any, any interest so far. Um, I should mention, by the way, that uh, the control of noise at work now also covers people in orchestras and bands and so on, because it's well known that, for example, if you have a, uh, a professional musical career where you're sitting in front of the trombones for a large part of 
rehearsal time and performances, you have some hearing loss. Um, <coughs> and at the South Bank University, they worked out simple ways that that, that can be avoided. <coughs> so, I, because I'm talking in Northern Ireland, I've, I've investigated what is taught about acoustics in Northern Ireland. And I've come to the conclusion that Northern Ireland is a good place where uh, my words, somebody should take notice of what I'm saying, uh, that the acoustics is a, a relevant thing, an important thing, and a rich thing to, to, to get into, because there's not much of acoustics teaching in, at the university level in Northern Ireland. So Ulster University teaches acoustics and noise control as part of its environmental health degree. It also teaches acoustics across the um, if you like, the civil engineering and building surveying departments also. But that's the only example I've been able to find of acoustics teaching within a uh, university level within Northern Ireland. On the other hand, we know that there's some research going on, and I'm sad to see that although at one time the mechanical engineering department at Queen's was doing some research in acoustics, it doesn't do it Currently, now I know, I've been a head of a department of engineering and I know that basically the research that goes on depends on the staff you hire. So if any of you have any influence on any of the um, chairs of the engineering department in Queen's or elsewhere, persuade them that a good area, a rich area, would be to employ someone who has some expertise in acoustics. So fortunately, uh, we're going to be hearing from some people at Queen's after my talk. And have I used my time up? Probably. So here are my concluding remarks. Acoustics is an important subject. It, it, it informs, it's used in lots of different areas. I didn't spend a lot of time about how it's used in medicine these days, but um, scanning of fetuses, scanning of... Um, uh, uh, healing of fracture. Um, high intensity focus ultrasound is used in surgery these days. I don't want people to end up doing any of these things if they don't know a lot about sound. And I think one of the dangers of the way we teach engineering, physics, or indeed medicine at the moment is that if there is any acoustics, it comes in as an ad hoc and need to know basis. And I don't think that's a good way of doing it. Um, Acoustics has lots of different applications, and it's very important to music. So, for goodness sake, if we're going to teach professional musicians, in view of the fact that they are going to, in fact, be exposed to hearing risk if they're playing in orchestras or rock bands, they need to know at least about the, what the, the risk is to their hearing, and preferably they need to know also about musical instruments acoustics and room acoustics. So, please, let's have something in the music curricula that covers it. And that way, acoustics not, is not just for STEM, but it's also for STEAM. Thank you very much.